Okay, this is Canon Law 2 in Semi-Exile, Lesson 4 on the Eucharist, pretty much the end of this lesson, and this is October 7th, 2020. The last thing we talked about, which would have been on October 5th, was how many times per day a priest can celebrate Mass and how many times per day the faithful may receive communion. So we're we're picking up from there. And um, Woodall talks about certain liturgical abuses and that's that's where we are in the in the text. Notice something. When he's talking about liturgical abuses, he very frequently cites this document, Redemptionis Sacramentum. Uh, it's a two thousand four document of the Congregation for Divine Worship, and it's called uh, Redemptionis Sacramentum. He really cites this document a lot. Uh, it would be worthwhile for you to read it if you're um, interested. It's it's long, but it's not gigantic. It's probably 40 pages long, so uh, you might at least, at least anyhow, take note how often it's cited. It deals with a lot of liturgical abuses. Um, so talking there... Woodall uh, says that, and he's citing Canon 908, he said, A priest may not celebrate with priests or ministers of churches or ecclesial communities not having full communion with the Catholic Church. So you can't celebrate, essentially celebrate Mass um, with non-Catholic priests or ministers. It really stands to reason, but sometimes I think people might think that maybe in in terms of ecumenism, we have a uh, we have a more flexible rule, but we really don't. Um, so take a look at Canon nine hundred eight if you if you need to. The um, another uh, Canon nine hundred seven, the laity and deacons. Um, do not perform those functions that belong to the uh, priest, especially saying the Eucharistic prayer, other or other acts that are proper to the priest. But the Eucharistic prayer would be one of the one of the key ones. And then um, our next subject is the minister of Holy Communion, and of course we have ordinary and extraordinary ministers. The um, the ordinary minister is a cleric, any cleric, a bishop, priest, or deacon, so usually a priest or deacon. And um, the extraordinary minister uh, can be a lay person. You can take a look at, um, at uh, Canon 230, which allows lay people, um, for the most part, on a temporary basis to be uh, ministers of really extraordinary ministers of uh, Holy Communion. A real key and something very important to remember is that if there are ordinary ministers present, they should be distributing communion, not the extraordinary ministers. The ordinary ministers should be distributing communion. Ordinary ministers should not be sitting down while extraordinary ministers distribute communion, at least usually. Um, if the ordinary minister is aged or infirm, um, that's a different, that's a different case. Then uh, we can, we, we can see that there's a reason uh, that the extraordinary ministers are, are administering uh, communion rather than the ordinary. But aside from that, uh, so it really is a case of the ordinary minister either being unable or not reliably able to. Yeah, maybe I won't fall, but I'm really in danger of falling, and I, you know, just broke my hip recently. Something like that. Yeah, sure. There's, there's, uh, we, we can we want to be reasonable here, but um, for the most part, the uh, ordinary minister should be distributing if they're if they're present. 
Um, we have a section on viaticum in the chapter. Viaticum is just holy communion that's administered to a dying person. Usually it's going to be the pastor who administers viaticum, at least he has he has preference. It could also be administered by the parochial vicar, a chaplain, or another priest. However, if the pastor and other priests are unavailable, then an acolyte or an, an uh, extraordinary minister of uh, communion could administer viaticum. They can administer a viaticum because it's the administration of communion, but of course an acolyte or a uh, extraordinary minister of communion could not uh, anoint, could not absolve sins, hear confessions, uh, etc. Um, if you do, if you are an acolyte or a extraordinary minister of communion and you do give viaticum, you should notify the pastor. Um, let's see. Okay, and then we have a section on participation in the Eucharist. What all reminds us that this kind of depends on our condition in the church. Are we prohibited from receiving Basically, are we under a penalty like excommunication? Or what other sacraments have we received? We don't receive uh, uh, the Eucharist until we've at least received baptism already. So kind of our condition in the church um, depends on, uh, depends on uh, or I guess we could say, our, yes, our reception depends on our condition in the church and our condition in the church could be where are we as far as having received having received the sacraments um, it, have we received other sacraments first that are supposed to come before this sacrament also am I in full communion with the church and um, again is there a penalty? Okay, what about children? Uh, children may receive communion in the West at the age of reason. And first, here's the same principle. How many sacraments have you received before communion? Well, baptism, of course, but also confession. And this is Canon, canon uh, 914. Um, the uh, children are supposed to go to confession before they go to their first communion. Uh, communion. There were in maybe the 80s, especially the 80s, 70s, maybe the 90s, some experiments with switching the order so that um, confession came after first communion. Uh, usually they, they it's first, first confession and then shortly afterwards first communion follows. Um, there were some experiments in the maybe 70s and 80s, maybe 90s, with um, going to First Communion without going to confession first. To the extent that those were ever legitimate at all, they're not permitted anymore. So now children are to go to their first confession before they go to their First Communion. In danger of death, a child could receive... Uh, communion um, as long as he could uh, distinguish it from ordinary bread. That's kind of our, our test. And that's in canon, uh, that can be found in canon 913. And um, also, of course, to receive communion, uh, we want to be in a state of grace. This is something that will, this Canon 915 is uh, is important, Canon 915 and 916. We'll be talking about this more in our next lesson uh, when we talk about the divorced and remarried and um, uh, Morris Letizia, Pope Francis's document, and John Paul's document, uh, Familiaris Consortio. Uh, but as Woodall says, being in a state of grace also is a is a requirement. Other norms for Holy Communion, one is the the Easter duty. The Easter duty from Canon 920. That simply means that you are to receive communion at least once a year, and 
you are to receive it during the Easter season. We talked um, last time already about when a person may receive communion twice in a day. If you're going to receive a second time, the second time must be at Mass. And for the most part, twice in a day is the, is the maximum. Really, the older rule, as we said, was once in a day, but kind of by exception, um, following Vatican II, communion twice in a day was permitted. Usually, sort of the understanding, or at least the original reason for the rule, was kind of the special occasion. You know, you've already gone to Mass in the morning, but then there's your nephew's confirmation in the afternoon, or a wedding, or something, so to permit you still to um, kind of participate fully in that, that second Mass. So it's, uh, it's okay to receive twice um, as a pretty regular thing, but remember the longer tradition is receiving once a day and the 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 twice the twice a day at least the original reason for it was um f basically for a special for a special occasion only you only receive a third time in a day if the third time is viaticum so very very rarely we talked about how to calculate a day um we talked about that in class so i don't think we we have to talk about that now. Basically, you're free not to count the Saturday Vigil Mass as a Sunday Mass. You can use what we would call a canonical day, which is midnight to midnight, rather than the liturgical day. And again, if you look at the exegetical commentary, the comments to Canons 202 and 905, you'll get two different rationales, one for for counting, uh, one for using the liturgical day, so for counting the vigil as part of the Sunday or Holy Day, and the other one for not counting the vigil. So you're, I think you're really free to do either one. There's a a, a reason, there's, there's a good rationale behind behind each one. Uh, I, I would I would actually say probably the stronger rationale is. The canonical day more than the liturgical day because that's really the default is that it will be the canonical day unless otherwise specified and here it's not otherwise specified so again there's still respectable people who say you look at it as a liturgical day uh, I think there's plenty of there's enough sufficient reasons that you could do whichever whichever you want personally I think that the um, uh, using the canonical day is probably uh, a bit uh, a bit stronger. Okay, um, let's now talk about um, the uh, well. Okay, the the communion fast is something that we could talk about. The communion fast is one hour, so that's one hour before reception. So not one hour before Mass. So it's actually a very short fast. And um, the a priest celebrating multiple Masses only needs to fast before the first one. He does. It may not be possible to fast before, if he has three morning Masses, um, he may not get to have breakfast until afternoon if he tries to fast before each one. So he only needs really to fast before the before the first one. Um, you, of course, can receive communion in any Catholic rite. What does that mean by any Catholic rite? In the Anglican use, uh, that would be the Catholic, um, Catholic masses said in the Anglican use. Uh, also, the Eastern, Eastern Catholic, uh, Eastern Catholic, uh, divine liturgies such as the Maronite, the Byzantine, etc. And when we talk about the the precious blood, we want to we want to limit the amount that is consecrated and consume all of it uh, at the celebration. And um, we we limit the amount consecrated because it is not reserved. The host is reserved. The precious blood is not, 
and never put the precious blood down the sacrarium uh, and never reserve it either. The main thing when we talk about reservation is to avoid profanation. Uh, there's no reservation in a private house. Um, there may be a few people in the world who have the privilege of reserving it on their house or estate. Maybe they have a private chapel or something, but very much the very much the exception. Uh, where where it is reserved, where the Blessed Sacrament is reserved, there always has to be someone responsible for it. Security is the key issue. Again, reserve the host, but not the precious blood, and reserve it in a tabernacle. In a church, the faithful should have daily access to the church. They should be able to enter the church and visit the Blessed Sacrament for some time every day. Um, maybe best case for a lot of the day, kind of like business hours or something, so that people on a break or over lunch could come and visit. But if it's not possible to keep it open for eight or ten hours that way, then at least a couple of hours in the in the morning or afternoon or sometime, so that people can can come and visit the Blessed Sacrament for uh, exposition and benediction. The proper minister is a priest or deacon. That's Canon Nine Four Three. An acolyte or extraordinary minister also can expose and repose the Blessed Sacrament in special circumstances as established by the diocesan bishop. But the acolyte and extraordinary minister may not bless. They may not bless the people with the with the monstrance. Okay. Um, all right, now we're going to talk about an important issue of called communicatio in sacris or communion in sacred things or sometimes called sacramental sharing and the key canon is 844 extremely important canon there is absolutely no doubt that you will be called upon to address this situation um, and not even not really hypothetically only uh, in in your own ministry if you're uh, you you certainly will will have this will have this issue when we talk about when we talk about uh, communicatio in sacris we have to distinguish we have to distinguish different types of christians because how closely the other communities are to the catholic church is going to determine how much sharing there can be in in uh with the sacraments so we've got two big two big categories churches versus ecclesial communities churches are bodies that have um, now both are both churches and ecclesial communities are christian so they're both christian churches have apostolic succession a valid episcopate um, valid bishops, and their churches have the full substance of the Eucharistic mystery. So who qualifies as a church? What you should think of first are the Eastern Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, the um, Russian Orthodox, etc. And then there are some other churches that are in the same situation. One is called the Old Catholic Church, and another is called the Polish National Catholic Church. Those would be the main ones, above all the Orthodox. Whenever we use examples, it will be with the Orthodox, but just keep in mind that the Old Catholic Church and the Polish National Catholic Church are all also in the same condition. They, that is, they are fully churches. They have an episcopate. They have the fullness of the Eucharistic mystery, and they've preserved apostolic succession. I think there are some others as well, but these are definitely the, the main ones. Well, then what is an ecclesial community? Those are the Protestant communities. All of the Protestant communities are ecclesial communities. They're Christian. Um, they have baptism. They have marriage. They do not. Uh, they do not have the other sacraments. Um, they and they they don't have a they don't have apostolic succession, or a or a valid 
uh, Episcopate. Uh, I mean, I mean, they will speak of confirming, but we're going to say since we believe the the the, the proper minister of confirmation is a bishop, at least in the West, that it would not be a valid confirmation in the Protestant communities. So another way to th a shorthand to think of churches versus ecclesial communities would be Orthodox when we think of churches and Protestant when we think of ecclesial communities. Again, Protestant, really all of the Protestant communities, even the Anglicans, but then also Methodist, Baptist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, etc. Okay, when we talk about um, when we talk about communicatio in Socrates, we have five different cases that we're going to talk about. Five different factual scenarios. We're going to mention all five of them, but we're only actually going to uh, we're only actually going to um, discuss four of them uh, right now. We're going to discuss another one another one in class. So let's start with our our first our first one is the easiest one. The first case we have um, a Catholic priest and a Catholic faithful. This is just our ordinary case, sort of our baseline case. Our general assumption is that a Catholic priest gives the sacraments only to Catholic faithful, and you'll find that in Canon 844, Section 1. There are exceptions, but this is our overall understanding, our, our baseline, our foundation. That's case one. Catholic, Catholic minister, Catholic priest, but uh, giving the sacraments to the Catholic faithful, or administering the sacraments. Okay, our second case is a... Catholic faithful approaching an Orthodox priest for the sacraments of either penance, the Eucharist, or anointing of the sick, and that's ruled by Canon 844, Section 2. So again, here we've got a Catholic uh, person, a Catholic member of the faithful, who approaches an Orthodox priest for one of these three sacraments. So what we're saying is, there are some situations in which a Catholic could receive these three sacraments, penance, Eucharist, and anointing, uh, from an Orthodox priest. What are those circumstances? One is there's a case of necessity or spiritual advantage. Necessity, uh, often going to be danger of death. Spiritual advantage, like it sounds, uh, is a broader category. Uh, that could be you're your, um, traveling in Greece and you don't have access to Catholic Mass, so you feel it would be to your spiritual advantage to go to uh, for the celebration of the sacraments, so you might go to the Greek Orthodox Divine Liturgy. So number number two, um, and that's going to be number three. Let's, let's jump to number three before two. Physical or moral impossibility to approach a Catholic minister. You're, so you're traveling in Greece, and there's either you're dying, it's a case of necessity, or um, you think there would be a spiritual advantage uh, to your attending, and it's physically or morally impossible for you to reach your own minister, which would be a Catholic minister. You can't go to Catholic Mass. That's number, that's number three. That's why number three says, uh, impossibility. You just, th there aren't any uh, churches for you to go to, at least in the region you're at. And then number two is that you eliminate the kind of the risk of error or indifferentism. You're going to a non-Catholic uh, liturgy, a divine liturgy, and you're going to be receiving communion. This is not the norm for a Catholic. It's permissible under these circumstances, but you must be sure that you're not going to be in the risk of falling into error, uh, you know, embracing a non-Catholic doctrine or indifferentism, embracing the idea that it doesn't matter uh, which church I go to for the for the sacraments. What is we said? What physical impossibility is? That means there's just no church around, or there's no Catholic priest I can go to for these sacraments. Again, in these 
th these examples we're talking about, it's we're talking about these three sacraments, penance, Eucharist, and anointing. Um, moral impossibility would be a situation where there is a Catholic priest available, but you can't go to him for some reason. There's some strong reason, some internal reason that you can't go to him. One reason might be uh, he's your family member, and you're like, well, I just can't. I just can't go to confession to my to my brother. I would just just can't do that. Um, I just don't feel that I can do that. I, f I find that morally impossible. Or it's someone who's a great enemy of yours, or someone who's done a great wrong of yours. Maybe someone who's committed a, a crime against you. This this uh, priest has done something bad to you. You're like, I just could never be alone with that person, much less confessing my, my sins to him. So those would be some examples of moral impossibility. Okay, so, so that's our case too. Rarely possible, but you could imagine the situation where Catholic faithful could receive from an Orthodox priest. Okay, case three, that when the Orthodox faithful want to receive from a Catholic priest. So, and again, we've got over here, we're talking about these three sacraments, penance, Eucharist, anointing. This um, section three here, this is also the section of Canon 844, so we're in section three. Now, it's actually easier for the Orthodox to go, at least under Catholic law, for the Orthodox to approach a Catholic priest than for a Catholic to go to an Orthodox divine liturgy. There's only two requirements for the Orthodox to come to Catholic Mass. One is that they spontaneously ask on their own, that it's their own idea. You, you're, you, if you're their friend who's taken them to Catholic Mass, you're not urging them or suggesting that they go. They just say, boy, I would like to receive if it's permissible under your Catholic practice. Uh, that's that's number one. It's really their own idea, not you prodding them. And number two, they're properly disposed, just like a Catholic. They can go if they're properly if they're if they're properly disposed. Um, so so quite a low barrier for Orthodox to be able to receive. Uh, although we're talking about these three sacraments of penance, Eucharist, and anointing, when this comes up, it's usually in the context of the Eucharist, very often the context of a funeral mass or a wedding mass, uh, where you have uh, a lot of non-Catholics who might be who might be present. Okay, so that's our case. That's our case three. Uh, kind of the difficult thing is just to remember that it's the, the, the barrier for Orthodox to be able to receive under case three is it's quite a bit lower than it is for Catholics to be able to go to the Orthodox divine liturgy because uh, especially because of requirement number three, which is um, there has to be this impossibility of uh, the Catholic approaching a Catholic um, a Catholic priest. Okay, our fourth situation is the most difficult, and it's it concerns Protestants, and um, it's so difficult we're not going to really talk about it right now. But it's a Protestant faithful approaching a Catholic minister, uh, and again, probably we're talking about the Eucharist, but it could also be penance or anointing. This is the hardest case; it has the most conditions to it, so we'll cover it in class. Just keep in mind, it's one of our it's one of our factual scenarios, but we want to talk about it more in class. And then our fifth scenario, we've talked about every possible option, I think, except one, which is what about a Catholic faithful who wants to approach a Protestant minister uh, for, um, for the sacraments? And again, we're really thinking of penance, the Eucharist, or anointing, or whichever ones whichever ones they have. Obviously, you can't approach the, uh, approach the um, uh, Protestant minister for a sacrament they don't have. Well, in a sense, they don't have any of these sacraments. Even though they do have the Lord's Supper, in a sense, they don't have the fullness of the Eucharistic ministry. So it's actually never possible for a Catholic faithful to go to a Protestant minister for these sacraments. And again, we're thinking mostly of the Eucharist, but because there's no valid apostolic succession, there's no valid bishops, so there are no 
no valid priests, so there can't be a valid Eucharist. It's not possible for Catholics to uh, attend, um, or, or well, you could attend, but you could not actually receive uh, receive communion at a Protestant uh, service. And the same with penance, if they have it, some Anglicans uh, may have a penance service. Um, anointing, I'm not, I'm not sure about. Okay, that's communicatio in sacris. Again, we've just got this one very important kind of difficult area that we're going to talk about in class, which is going to be our case for um, the uh, Protestants coming to Catholic Mass. Okay, we have another um, another issue to discuss, which is one of almost the last one that Woodall gets to, which is offerings for masses. And there are 14 canons on this, which is quite a lot. Um, how many canons are there on exorcism, for example? One. Uh, one on exorcism, 14 on offerings for masses. So this is very important. If you think about it, you can tell why it's so important, because... We've had difficulties in history over maybe not so much offerings in this sense, but you can see how um, the question of indulgences is uh, somewhat connected here. So it's something we want to be very careful about and to do correctly. And if you want to never have a problem with this and um, not ever get into trouble with it, Here's, here's the rule of thumb you should, you should follow, which is one mass, one intention. So you're celebrating, let's say, one mass a day. One intention, um, only one intention at this mass you're celebrating. One stipend, you're only accepting one stipend or offering at this mass on one day. So each day you only have... Um, uh, one intention at the Mass that you're celebrating, and you only accept one stipend or offering. I'm not saying that you can't celebrate that you can't celebrate a second Mass. What I'm saying is, if you do, you don't. If you do celebrate a second Mass, also only one intention at that Mass, but don't keep a stipend for it. Um, you will talk about this. You can accept a stipend, but then the rule is you you. Uh, uh, you give it to the, you send it to the diocese. You can keep one, and the other goes to the uh, to the diocese. What else says on two ninety that masses with multiple intentions can be legitimate? And there's a document on this from nineteen ninety one that he references. So uh, this is basically a rule of safety. It's not saying that you you're acting illegally if you don't follow this rule. So it is possible to have more than one intention. Um, I do not think it's a great idea. Um, you you just have to be very careful. What Woodall says is if you do this, keep only the standard offering. There might be whatever, three or five intentions, but keep only the standard offering and give the rest to, uh, give the rest to charity. Um, so again, if you celebrate two Masses, that's fine. Um, but just rule of safety, just one intention at each Mass. Um, except either, uh, when I say one stipend, I mean you keep one stipend and either don't accept a stipend for the second Mass or accept it, but you send it to the diocese, which is in Canon 950 and 951. And again, we're talking about that's the rule for, for one day. There is an exception to those two exceptions. On uh, Christmas and on All Souls Day, you are permitted to keep up to three offerings for those days, and that's fine to do. That's uh, e Even if you're you know very, very serious about following this rule, all the other days of the year, perfectly perfectly fine to accept three offerings on uh, Christmas and All Souls Day. Um, what about people who cannot afford a stipend? Canon 945 encourages you very strongly to celebrate um, for them, to, to celebrate without a stipend if they're not able to give you one. Um, okay, a... You uh, probably have heard of the Mass for the people, people, the Missa pro Populo, that both the bishop and a pastor are obliged to celebrate each 
each week, each each Sunday for their people. Now, a pastor, he cannot accept an offering for the Missa Pro Popolo as part of his office. He doesn't accept an offering for that. However, what if he can't, what if he's going to be away from the parish for a weekend and he won't be there to celebrate the Missa Pro Popolo? Uh, he should, or he may, um, whoever is going to celebrate it for him. There still has, still has to be celebrated. Might be celebrated by the parochial vicar, might be celebrated by a priest from outside the parish. Uh, the pastor should give an offering to that priest who's essentially celebrating the Missa Pro Popolo for him. What about con celebration? You can accept an offering for a con celebrated mass if it's your first mass of the day or if it's your only mass of the day. Uh, those are the only times you can accept a uh, you can accept an offering for the uh, for a con celebrated mass. So if you've said a mass in the morning, you've accepted an offering, then um, later on in the day you can't celebrate a mass. You cannot accept a you cannot accept a an offering or stipend for that second that con celebrated mass. And again, if you if you um, con celebrated a mass first thing in the morning with another priest and then you con celebrate another mass later in the day you can accept a, an offering for the first con celebrated mass uh, but not the second it has to be your your first or your or your only mass of the day to accept an offering for a for a con celebrated uh, for a con celebrated mass um, okay. All right, and then what I'll finish. Oh, oh, you need to have a. You need to keep a book where you keep a keep track of the offerings you've accepted, uh, the intention, and when you fulfill that offering, when you uh, fulfill that, when you actually say the mass, so that this can be expected by the diocese and they can see that you've accepted such and such offerings and that you are keeping track and making sure that you celebrate those. And if something should happen to you and you unfortunately uh, are sick or even pass away, someone will, someone will find your, your mass book and they'll realize that there are 20 masses left to be said and, and uh, um, someone will be found to to celebrate those masses for you and for, really for the people who've who've uh, made made offerings there and you should not accept offerings for more masses than you can say in a in a year so you don't want to go further out in accepting offerings than than a year um, so if you're if you're booked up for a year you're not taking offerings again until you you know, sort of get some of those uh, masses celebrated that you've agreed to agreed to celebrate. Okay, finally, there's a section in this chapter on the extraordinary form of the mass from Woodall, and uh, he's focusing especially on the 2007 document of Pope Benedict the Sixteenth Summorum Pontificum, which provided that any priest may celebrate mass according to the 1962 missile uh, without needing the approval of his bishop um, and essentially the priest can celebrate without the people uh, basically a, an unscheduled mass what we're calling mass without a congregation so not really on the parish schedule uh, but people could still come to it it's called kind of mass without a congregation because it's not a scheduled mass but people could could still come. Sometimes people will call this a private mass, as we said the other day in class. That's not the best term. Mass without a congregation is a better term um, because that shows that there's no such thing as a private mass. Unfortunately, saying mass without a congregation can be a little bit misleading because there may be a few people present uh, there. So we don't have a great term for this uh, kind of unscheduled mass. Maybe that would actually be be better. Um, and uh, to have sort of a scheduled mass, to have it sort of on the, as a regular thing at the parish, you need sort of a group of people, what the Latin word is, cetus, C-O-E-T-U-S. Um, 
And uh, keep one thing in mind. What all, what all seems somewhat open to the bishop's intervention here, and 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 that's that, that's okay. Um, but uh, he's writing in 2011. Samorum Pontificum came out in 2007, but in 2013, an instruction on Samorum Pontificum came out, um, and the instruction was called Universe Ecclesiae, and it made clear that um, some of the things that might tend to restrict availability of the Latin Mass, um, really, you have to be either not do them or or be careful about them. For example, there were some bishops saying that you you had to really be very very good in Latin to to celebrate the mass. You had to really uh, have a, a very good understanding of Latin. And University of Ecclesia says not really. Um, you don't need to be an, a Latin expert. You just you need to be able to pronounce the words correctly, essentially. So you don't have to be a great expert. Some also said some bishops said that this group, this chaitus, who wants the Latin Mass, and you as pastor may be willing and able to uh, fulfill their their requ their desire. Um, some bishops said that this chaitus has to come all from one parish. In University of Ecclesia, they said, no, it's okay if they come from different parishes, and they ask a pastor who seems well-suited to be able to satisfy the or is centrally located so that most people could, uh, most people could attend it. Um, and um, okay, good. That's really the end of this of this chapter. We still have. We want to talk a little bit more about communicatio and sacris, but uh, we will uh, do that as well. Thank you.